right. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite the children and people, if you'd come up here and join me. Please be seated on the front row here. Let's have our children's message. Come on up. Good. Great. Well, this morning I brought with you uh, a lamp. Yeah, just a lamp. And this particular lamp, this particular lamp, I can't, it's just, it, it doesn't work. See, listen, can you hear it? On, off, doesn't work. Off, doesn't work. Okay, we'll try and plug it in. Maybe that's what the trick. There's one right up here. That's right. Got to use the old brain, don't you? All righty. Well, that's you guys figured that one out, didn't you? For it. Huh? Yeah. For it to work, it's got to be plugged into the source, right? Here's our source over here. Yeah, so it's got to be plugged in to work, all right? So to get light, it's got to be plugged in, right? Uh, yeah, well, Jesus is going to use he uses a story. Today we're going to be talking about the vine and the branches. And uh, in the story, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and nor, meaning the, the vine, he's, he's the main part, okay? And then he says, we are the branches. And uh, it says, in order to bear fruit or to have light, you got to be plugged into the source, okay? So tell me, do you think this branch here is going to live very long? So it's been removed from the source. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, so so it's broken off the main source, so it's not going to live anymore. And uh, what happens if we unplug the light? It doesn't work either. So what do you think the secret is for you guys to bear fruit i mean to live to bring give light what what's the secret for you guys to give light do you think remember we got to have a source what do you think that source is that's right you got to be plugged into jesus got to be plugged into god so what's the first step about getting plugged into jesus well well that's important but the very very first step to getting plugged into jesus is what inviting jesus into our our heart's life. So we be, need to become a Christian. So we need to say, Jesus, I need you. I'm not giving much light at all. In fact, I'm giving no light. So would you come and be my Savior? So that's the first step in giving light. But then, after we get plugged into Jesus, the Bible, reading the Bible, praying, and that when you do those things, the light comes out of you. And what do you think that light looks like? The Bible talks about we need to bear fruit and we use the lamp to show that we need to be light. What, what would be an example of being light or being fruitful? Got any examples? Okay, you got the first step in. You got Jesus in your heart. You've invited Jesus to be your Savior. And so you're plugged into the source, and he wants you to be fruitful. What would, what would you do? What could you do that would show that you have light in you or you are fruitful? You could share. Very good. That's fruit. That's light, right? What else? You could share. I just said that. <laughs> um, you could uh, listen to mom and dad. And the word that we use about that is called obey. Okay, that's being plugged into the source. Okay. So, when you're not uh, obeying mom and dad, okay. Let's get this right. When you're not obeying mom and dad... This is what's kind of happening in your life. Uh-huh. Uh, 
you guys aren't connected to the source very good. So when things aren't going well, you've got to say, okay, am I connected to the source or not? If you're not being friendly to your friends, am I connected to the source? If you're not obeying mom and dad, am I connected to the source? If I'm mad at my brother and sister, we could ask, am I connected to the source? No. Probably not, right? All right. So for you to be a fruitful Christian, you got to be plugged into the source, and that is what? Jesus, right? Yep, Jesus. Good. Well, that's the end of our children's message. You guys can grab a piece of candy there by uh, Miss Nancy, and then you can join her in children's church. She's going to be leading your children's church this morning. All right. Thanks, guys. Well, I have a question for you guys as you uh, remain here and not depart to Children's Church. Uh, let me ask you a question. How are you doing as a Christian? How are you doing as a Christian? If that's not necessarily the question you ask yourselves from time to time, well, let me... Permit me to challenge you, and let me ask you, how are you doing as a Christian? Would there be enough evidence in your life, if you were to appear in a court of law, would there be enough evidence in your life, enough fruit in your life, to convict you of being a Christian? Well, this morning we come to our final message in the I Am series. This is our last one, and it's, uh, we've been doing a series of I Am statements that Jesus has made on the, in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, and there have been seven of them. And this morning we come to the final one, number seven, and this morning we'll be studying Jesus' truth claim of being the true vine, the true vine. And that passage of scripture is in John chapter 15, so I invite you to take your Bibles and join me in the Gospel of John, John chapter 15, and uh, let's look at verses 1 through 17 as we talk about Jesus as the true vine. John chapter 15, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 17. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man or a woman remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such, a bran such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no, no one than this, that they laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. 
love each other. Here ends the reading of our passage this morning. Our passage of Scripture this morning will help you answer the question that we began with, and that is, how are you doing as a Christian? Are you producing fruit? Are you plugged in, and is your light shining? Our passage this morning shares with us some truths, some principles that we can implement in our life that will help us stay connected to the source, thus bringing light and bearing fruit. And so we're going to look at those principles at this time. And I'm going to share with you four principles, four principles that will help you, assist you in being fruitful. So let's look at those principles at this time. Number one, here's number one, and we're talking about keys to a fruitful Christian life. Keys to a fruitful Christian life. Number one is this. You need to be connected to the right source. Success and fruitfulness in the Christian life depends upon being connected to the right source. Now, our world offers many ideas, many suggestions, Numerous approaches for success and fruitfulness. But what we learn about those approaches is that they are temporary and they bring frustration. That is the world's. Now, for example, here's what the world will say will bring you success, will bring you fruitfulness. The world says that your job brings success. But what happens if the job is taken away? The world says your health is the ticket to fruitfulness. But what happens if COVID attacks or cancer invades your life? The world says that your success and your fruitfulness depends on possessions, and that's how you measure your fruitfulness. Well, what happens when the hailstorm totally annihilates your brand new car? Or somebody breaks in and steals all your property? Then what brings you fruitfulness, and success. Now, as I mentioned moments ago, the world's ideas are always temporary. They're temporary and they end in frustration. Their approach, their ideas to fruitfulness. Well, God, he makes it very simple here this morning. And he says, fruitfulness comes through your connection to the right source. To have a fruitful life in order for your light To shine, you need to be plugged in to the correct source. And that source, of course, is Jesus Christ. That's where it all begins. Success in your Christian life begins with a person. Fruitfulness in your Christian life starts with Jesus Christ. Verse 5, he says this, I am the vine. And you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So the key, first key principle I hear that we're talking about, based on John chapter 15, to be, to experience fruitfulness and success as a a Christian, you got to be plugged in to the right source. You need to be connected to the right source. Number two. To experience a fruitful Christian life, you need to understand the gardener's expectation for your life. Again, to be fruitful, you need to understand what the gardener's expectation is for you. God has an expectation for you. 
And that expectation is this, be fruitful. That's what he wants you to do. He says, I want you to be fruitful. Let's look at a couple of verses. First of all, John 15, verse 8. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And a little bit later, verse 16. You did not choose me, Jesus said, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So the gardener's expectation for each one of us is not to be idle in the Christian faith, but rather to produce fruit. In order to produce fruit, fruit that will last, we need to be plugged in to the correct source, and that is Jesus Christ. So the gardener's expectation then is to bear fruit. Now there's a question that will surface and let's address that question. Okay, we get it. God wants us to be fruitful. So what kind of fruit, then, is God seeking from our lives? It's a difficult question to answer and be specific about, and here's why. It's difficult to answer that question regarding the kind of fruit that God is looking for because I believe that the fruit that God is looking for from your life is tailor-made. Okay. God, for example, God may be looking for self-control in Grady's life. God may be uh, looking, for, um, looking for Lori to replace worry with trust. That might be his plan. God may be working on generosity in Terrace's life, while in Katie's life, he's seeking to develop patience. So it's difficult to pinpoint what it is that God wants from our lives, because I think it's tailor-made. The fruit that God is looking from in your life will be different from the fruit of the person that you're sitting next to. You see, God is... His pursuit in this fruit is tailor-made. However, having said that, having said that it's difficult to determine what these fruits are, we, as a people, we want to get to the bottom line. Okay, I need, I, need, I need something. Okay, if you want something, here it is. The one thing that demonstrates that you are bearing fruit and this comes from John 15, is this, obedience. If you're looking for something that you can just put in your pocket, just that one thing, here it is. It's obedience. God wants obedience. He says in verse 10, If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. Your fruitfulness depends on your obedience. Now remember, I said, I think God's fruit is tailor-made. So God is at work in each of your lives. And he's, he's desiring to bring fruit about. That tailor-made fruit depends upon your obedience. Okay. Number three, the key to fruitfulness in the Christian life. You need to accept the gardener's pruning. You need to accept the gardener's pruning. Let's just quickly review. Number one, remember our keys to fruitfulness in the Christian life is one, we need to be connected to the right source. That was number one. Number two, you need to understand as well as accept the gardener's expectation for you. And remember, the gardener's expectation is that you bear fruit. That's what he wants you to do. Number three here, to bear fruit, you also need to accept the gardener's pruning. The gardener's pruning. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful.
to experience fruitfulness in your Christian life, you need to accept the gardener's pruning. Are you willing to accept the gardener's pruning? Now, there's two aspects to pruning that I want to share with you at this time. Here they are. Number one, God prunes to remove sin. Number two, God prunes to remove overcrowding. Sinfulness and fruitfulness do not go together. Since God's desire for each one of you is to be fruitful, He will come after you and help you deal with sin. Okay? So, as you examine your life and you say, Am I fruitful as a Christian? And your conclusion is, mm, not too good. Well, your first step is to ask yourself, okay, is there a sin? Is there a sin issue in my life that I am ignoring or I am turning my head from, you know, and not dealing with it? If so, understand you need to deal with that because fruitfulness and sinfulness do not go together. So God prunes to remove sin. Secondly, God proves, or excuse me, prunes to remove overcrowding. Overcrowding. Uh, here's a brief illustration from an individual. His name is Kyle. Uh, he's an airline employee, and here's how God removed the overcrowding in his life. Listen to his brief testimony. Kyle says that after I became a Christian, I noticed that my monthly night out with my old crowd from high school began to leave me feeling empty and out of place. So I quit going. Interestingly enough, a few months later, I led one of the guys to the Lord. See, through Kyle's dissatisfaction, God was showing him that an old activity in his life, was dead or dying. It took up time and energy, giving little return. When Kyle let go of it, new results quickly showed in its place. The funny thing, or maybe I shouldn't say it's funny, maybe the deceptive thing regarding overcrowding is Lots of things in our lives are not bad. They're not bad. But they crowd out that which is better. And God works on us and says, hey, you don't need to be doing that. Is it bad? Well, no, it's not necessarily bad. But there is something better in your life, God says. Let's prune it out. Let's prune it out. So success... Fruitfulness in your Christian life depends upon whether or not you will listen to the pruner. Remember, we went back. Remember, part of it was obedience. Okay, God is removing sin in your life, or he's taking out some of the overcrowding so that you can be more fruitful. And that's what God desires of you. He wants you to be fruitful. That's his desire. And here's number four. Number four, the key to a fruitfulness in the Christian life is you need to abide in Jesus. You need to abide in Jesus. Your faithfulness, excuse me, your fruitfulness depends on your abiding. In fact, it's interesting as you read through those 17 verses that we read a little bit earlier, it talks about he, uh, the, the the passage uses the word either abide or if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. So the words abide or remain in those first 17 verses it occurs 11 times, 11 times. So usually when we try to instruct a family member or we want them to get it, what do we do? We repeat it. We repeat it. God is repeating here. 
It says, if you want fruitfulness in your life, well, you need to remain in me. You need to abide in me, he says in those verses. Look at verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man or a woman remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. So a key to fruitfulness in the Christian life is by remaining or abiding in Jesus Christ. So that leads us to another question that we want to answer, ask and answer. What does it mean then to remain or abide? Okay, we get it. We know that scripture makes that clear. We need to remain. We need to abide. He told us 11 times, remain or abide. Okay, what does that look like? What is that? Well, let me see if I can bring some clarity to that. Let me do so by an illustration. So here's abiding or remaining in Christ. For example, when you sit down as a family to eat a meal together, you are abiding. Okay? You share laughter around the table. You laugh at your jokes around the table. Okay? You tell stories. And what you are doing is you're entering into your family's life, aren't you? As you sit around the table. What you are doing is abiding. When you abide in Christ, you accept his invitation to join him at the dinner table. Okay. When you go on a journey and you're confined to the car for many hours, you are abiding. In the car, windshield time, right? What do you do? You talk. You dream together. You share all aspects of your life with one another. The day's events, the past week's events. In that car, you are abiding. You're spending time together. You're, you're learning about one another. Jesus invites us to sit down at the table and spend time with him. Jesus invites us to step into his automobile, if you will, step into the car and just abide, just sit with him and talk and laugh and dream together. He says, when you spend time with me, you will bear much fruit. Application. What do we do? I begin with this question, are you connected? Remember, the first essential step necessary to experience a fruitful Christian life is that we need to know Jesus Christ. We need to be connected to Jesus Christ. And what we're talking about is salvation. It's coming to that point in our life where we recognize, one, that we are no good. Okay, We are a sinner. We don't do things right. We understand that no matter how hard we strive to be good, it's not going to cut it. We need to come to Jesus Christ by faith and trust and believe in him. That's where the salvation comes. So that's where we plug in to the source. So it all begins with the source. So if you don't know Christ, that's number one step. Find and know Jesus Christ. Number two. Are you experiencing pain? Embrace it. And again, this goes back to the idea of the pruning, okay? Remember, Jesus doesn't want you to remain in your sinful situation, okay? And he, through his loving nature and faithfulness, is going to make it uncomfortable for you, okay? You're going to experience pain. Because of a sin issue. So I say embrace it. Let's deal with the sin issue. Let's confess it. Let's get right with the Lord. Remember, fruitfulness and sinfulness does not go together. So, are you experiencing pain? Well, number one, you ask yourself, is it 
a sin issue? Or is it my sin issue? Yes. Deal with it, okay? Second of all, maybe it's not the sin, but maybe it's overcrowding. Remember, we talked about that. The gardener, the vine dresser, he doesn't want things to crowd out, which is better. So he works at removing, sometimes simplifying our lives so that we can be more fruitful. So maybe that's what's causing you some pain and some discomfort in your life. Maybe God is saying, you got a little bit too much on your plate at this time. There's a few items that we need to release. Are they bad? No. But God wants you to know there's something better through the release of the overcrowding. So how do you experience a, Christ, excuse me, a fruitful Christian life? Well, one, it begins with the source. You got to be tied in to the right source. Second of all, the key to experiencing fruitfulness is you need to understand the gardener's expectation. He wants you to bear fruit. That's his objective. He doesn't want you coasting. He doesn't want you to settle in the status quo. There's so much more that he wants for you, and so he's going to make it uncomfortable for you. So we know you to understand the expectation of the gardener. Uh, number three, you need to accept the gardener's pruning. And then lastly, we talked about how we need to abide, how we need to remain, how we need to sit down at the dinner table with Christ and learn of him. And of course, he's given us some tools, God's word, exactly, right? Prayer. Uh, that was brought out with our children. Those are some steps. Those are some things that we can do. So, accept the pruning. God has something much better, something greater in your Christian life. Well, let's wrap it up with a benediction. What I want to do this morning as, we bring, as I bring the benediction to you, uh, I want to encapsulate all seven I am statements that we have just traveled through these past number of weeks and through these particular spiritual claims, these truth claims that Jesus has brought, let me bring a, a blessing and a challenge to you, okay? So please stand with me as I bring the benediction. Week one, we began with the bread of life. Then we proceeded to talk about the light of the world. We spent a weekend talking about how Jesus is the door to the sheepfold. We also spoke about the good shepherd. The good shepherd who is the resurrection and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. And finally we come to the true vine. Here's my prayer for you. The bread of life, who fed 5,000 people, he will provide for your needs. Trust him. May he who is the light of the world reveal more and more of himself as you abide in him. May he who is called the door open doors of opportunity for you to let your light shine. He who is the great shepherd, he knows your name. He will never leave you or forsake you. He who is the resurrection and the life desires you to remember. Remember, life is temporary. In my father's house are many rooms. I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. He who is the way, the truth, and the life deeply desires all to know him as Lord and Savior. For those who do not know Jesus as Savior, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Finally, the true vine invites you to abide in him. Sit at his table and allow him to pour into your life. For as you abide in Jesus, that which is significant and lasting will spring from your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.